Arizona's Supreme Court reinstates a 160-year-old abortion ban and as a spate of states rush to restrict reproductive rights, Republicans, including Donald Trump, scramble to insulate themselves from a potential political backlash. Meanwhile, Mike Johnson makes a pilgrimage to Mar-a-Lago to shore up support from Trump as right-wing members of his own party derail his agenda. Next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by Consumer Cellular. Certified financial planner professionals are proud to support Washington Week with The Atlantic. CFP professionals are committed to acting in their clients' best interest. More information at letsmakeaplan.org. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewen Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. I'm Franklin Four. Jeffrey Goldberg is away. Following Alabama's ban of in vitro fertilization and Florida's restriction of abortions after six weeks of pregnancy, the Arizona Supreme Court has ruled in favor of reviving a Civil War era law that prohibits nearly all abortions. Republicans are running to distance themselves from the surprise decision, while Democrats seize the opportunity to make gains in the battleground state. The ruling came just a day after former President Trump said he opposes a national abortion ban following months of mixed signals. How will Republican candidates navigate the post-Roe landscape now confronting them? Joining me tonight to discuss this and more, Lisa Desjardins is a congressional correspondent for PBS NewsHour. Susan Glasser is a staff writer at The New Yorker. Ryan Lizza is a chief Washington correspondent at Politico and co-author's playbook. And Domenico Montanaro is a senior editor, political editor and correspondent at NPR. Ryan, months of dithering, delaying uh, this announcement about Trump's position on the abortion ban. Could you take us inside the process that led to him coming out with this statement this week? Yeah, I mean, look, this is the, the first time in some ways since 2016 where he hasn't really gone with the pro-life uh, view, right? Mm. He, I mean, there are two issues that Trump really never uh, crossed a, a red line when it came to the, uh, activists in the Republican Party, guns and abortion. Now, the abortion, the, the, the pro-life activists got uh, more out of the Trump, uh, Trump's term than, than almost yeah. any other constituency in, in the Republican Party. And in the run-up to that announcement Monday, he was being advised by two different sets of, of, of people, one who wanted to be much closer to where the activists are, um, and one who said, this is going to cost you the election, even if, uh, if, if these same activists, um, you know, are, are, are going to put out statements crit criticizing you, which did happen. Um, but functionally, as the week went on, he's basically, I mean, you could argue he's basically pro-choice at this point by the, by the end of the week with what, with what he's saying about Arizona. At the very least, he is not able to hold this position of the states do their thing. Because as soon as a state, especially a swing state like Arizona, does something extreme, he has to um, criticize that, which, which, which he did this week. So I think it's one of those classic Trump world dramas where there's this big debate. He comes out with, it, with a statement, but they haven't necessarily thought, every, the, thought it through and been able to keep him consistent on this. Mm. Susan, you wrote a column in The New Yorker this week where you described the theatrics of the video that he produced when, uh, on Monday. I want to roll a little bit of tape from it and then have you play both the role of theater critic and psychoanalyst in response to it. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land. <laughs> Yeah, and we're laughing uh, because, of course, that was a classic bit of Donald Trump gaslighting. Nobody uh, 
is honest with you if they say that they know what Donald Trump actually thinks about abortion. He, this is a guy who said that he was very pro-choice. He was for it before he was against it. Yeah. Uh, when he was president, in fact, he said he would sign a national abortion ban. Uh, he arguably turned over his presidency uh, uh, more than any other to uh, the anti-abortion forces in his party. Uh, and of course, since the Supreme Court with a Trump appointed majority throughout Roe versus Raid, Donald Trump again and again and again has claimed credit for it because what do we know about Donald Trump? Uh, you know, bragging is his happy place. And uh, even in that video, in, in a portion we didn't hear, he says, I'm proudly the one who threw out Roe versus Wade. So I think that politically speaking, it's not uh, that he's pro-choice, it's that he's pro-anything that will get him out of this mess, politically speaking. And they have set up an untenable position for him politically right now, Frank, because he says, on the one hand, he's for states' rights, except, as Ryan pointed out, when the states do something that he thinks is going to be a problem for him, as happened in Arizona this week, he said, well, don't worry after the Arizona Supreme Court reinstated this 1864 law, he said, well, maybe the governor and the state legislature will fix it. <laughs> Didn't happen. The Republicans in the state legislature are not letting Donald Trump out of the box that he made. Well, listen to what he said there, right? I yeah. mean, he said everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint where it was. Well, I mean, it wasn't, huh. right? I mean, this is not where uh, the majority of the country wanted it. That's why Republicans have lost special election after special election when it comes to abortion rights, because th the majority of people wanted Roe to stay in place. And the chaos that has ensued with women not having access to reproductive rights in millions of women across the South in particular, this chaotic sort of patchwork yeah. of abortion, um, you know, laws across yeah. the country, that's made it really, really difficult. It's made it very untenable for Republicans. And frankly, there's not really going to be a line that Donald Trump can really take that is going to roll back the, 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 the fact that it were his three justices to the Supreme Court who made it possible to overturn Roe. And he's bragging about it, as Susan mentioned, yeah. that he's saying it's it, it, sometimes it's like you're not sure if Donald Trump realizes he's passed the primary because he's still trying to say to Republicans, hey, I gave you what you wanted here, right? You're happy, good. But also, if you're a swing voter, vote for me. It doesn't really work that way. It's not yeah. working that well. Yeah, I think the politics here are what mattered. And I, ha I also have to go back to when you said you could argue Trump is a pro-choice president. I was like, wait, what? No, no, pro-choice <laughs> pro candidate, candidate right now. What? Just position-wise this week. But I don't know. By I don't, I don't by know essentially, about that argument. Because yeah. I think he is still someone who wants to open all the doors to keep all the doors to restricting abortion open. He's saying that. Yeah. But this is just a political move by him. To me, his statement said almost nothing very effectively. What I got from that politically, though, was this is a candidate who is not worried about his base. He's not worried about yeah. all of those hard right evangelicals. He feels like he has them. He has to move and get the burden. left. Can, can That's I, what this is about. Can I just yeah. ask a question? Yeah. Does anybody at the table, just given the political conundrum that he's facing, think that there was a more elegant or a different solution for him to take in order to, to navigate the different shoals that he's navigating. Look, he, you know, Donald Trump is losing if he's talking about abortion, uh, yeah. in the, and, and that's the bottom line. He's not going to be able to talk himself out of this, and in fact, he's taken credit too many times for dismantling Roe. You know, there's nothing that Trump is going to do. And I think it's even more than messaging to his base mm -hmm. or something. I think it's just core to his personality. This is a historic thing, right? People tried for decades to get rid of Roe, and I'm the guy who did it. And in fact, that's often how he talks yeah. about this. What I found very interesting was that you immediately had the Biden campaign in the immediate aftermath of uh, Trump's video. They put up a new advertisement that I found particularly powerful. And it's of a Texas couple that uh, wanted to have a baby. The woman experienced a miscarriage, and because Roe had been thrown out, she was denied necessary medical care in Texas, sent home. She developed an infection. She got sepsis. She nearly died. She probably can't have a kid now. This ad is intimate. It's powerful. There's nothing about politics until the very end. And the tagline is just, Trump did this. I think those three words are going to haunt Trump's presidential campaign this year. Well, no, no matter what he does, right? No matter what words that he uses, no matter what he says, that's the that's yeah. the reality of where things are. And he said in that video, "Hey, uh, time for Republicans now. Now we did it. You can move on to inflation and immigration." 
um, there's a big section of the country that is not moving on. The Biden campaign has three ads in rotation mm -hmm. right now on this particular issue. They're making democracy and abortion rights central to their campaign, and that's where they want to keep I mean, it. Okay. Things, he could have stuck with the states' rights argument, but but offered a, a, a minimum set of standards, mm -hmm. which is what you know the pro-life community wanted him to do. And the second thing to say is, this is not going away. There is a... Um, uh, a, a group of conservative judges and a group of elected offic statewide officials around the country who are committed to pushing back uh, uh, against uh, abortion rights. And this is going to pop up again and again because there, uh, there's a whole universe of federal judges committed to this issue and a whole universe of state elected officials. Right. As we saw in Arizona, as Susan po pointed out, the, 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 the head of the House and Senate in Arizona they were behind this whole thing. Those are the people that Trump is saying, oh, you guys fix this with the Democratic governor. That is not going to happen. Yeah. Well, that I would also point out that, you know, this idea that states' rights, somebody told Donald Trump that it was a good idea to just say states' rights, uh, you know, not really a way out at all of the problem, uh, especially because there's not only the anti-abortion movement that's pressing for a national ban, but his opponents and for Democrats, if this is a human right for women to have access to health care, to have access to their reproductive rights, your rights shouldn't depend on what state you live in. Uh, if it's a right, it's a right. And it shouldn't matter that in Texas you have no access to something that you have in California. Lisa, <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask on Capitol Hill when you talk to Republicans, do they have a sense that the barn door has been opened with the Dobbs decision and that these sorts of tensions are going to haunt them. Absolutely. Yeah. They know that this is the issue, as everyone is saying, that, that they really have to try and overcome in November. And that's particularly a problem in the House, I think, at this moment. You know, Donald Trump sort of has this effect on the Republican Party mm. where he can galvanize attention on the party. He can also himself at least once ascend to the White House. Uh, he can give them a chance at the White House, but he causes problems for almost everyone else who is attached to him. They sort of get the baggage that he is able to shake off that he causes. Yeah. So there is incredible nervousness about this. And the IVF decision, they certainly have not resolved that, though Alabama tried to by sort of kind of saying that it's okay in a law that doesn't actually deal with the personhood issue. These are complicated dilemmas for the party that they cannot resolve by November, and they're trying to come up with other issues, immigration, like you said, yeah. that they want to talk about instead. Yeah, I wonder what they would make of those Republicans or these activists would make of Carrie Lake and the way in which she's dealt with this. I want to play some footage of Carrie Lake, who was once stridently pro-life, talking about her position now. This is such a personal and private issue. I chose life. But I'm not every woman. I want to make sure that every woman who finds herself pregnant has more choices so that she can make that choice that I made. I mean, <laughs> that's the Democratic position on abortion. That is a pro choice statement, essentially, right? She's it's used coded, the word, no, she it's uses coded. the word choice. Right. Now, it's maybe coded. she's more trying to be a, 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 more ambiguous. than nothing. More than nothing, which is what Arizona has right now. More choices might mean six weeks or 15 weeks or 20 weeks. Yeah. It's coded. It's but not listen, actually pro-choice. Yeah. I want Domenico, I want to, we've been talking broadly about the political implications. I want you to get granular. <laughs> you know, it, it, like it, how, how does this really actually affect the contours of the race in terms of the states, in terms of voting blocks? I mean, Democrats are searching for some sort of silver bullet I mean, is, is this it or is that just wishful thinking? Uh, I think they know that it certainly is helpful, can be helpful. I mean, right now the Biden, uh, the Biden campaign knows that he is you know, suffering from low approval ratings. He needs women to be fired up. He needs women in, uh, you know, especially those swing areas to be. But what we're seeing in our polling, in the NPR, PBS News, Hour, Maris polling, is that we're seeing with Biden, you know, he's down with independents, Latinos, especially younger voters. He's using some of this messaging in uh, trying to appeal to Latino, Latina voters. Um, but what we're also seeing is big shifts Shifts with college-educated white voters, mm. which is kind of buoying him in this. And abortion rights happens to be one of those issues that, you know, when it comes to abortion rights, January 6th, Trump's language, why we've seen these shifts continue. And they're pretty bullish about, say, the Southwest, because you have fewer blue-collar uh, white 
uh, working class voters in those places. The upper Midwest, certainly you have more blue collar white workers. The, the Biden campaign feels pretty good about a place like Michigan because they feel like they have enough uh, pro uh, union stances there and that they can get some of these groups back on board. But if they continue to be able to gain with white, uh, with white college educated voters, especially on an issue like abortion, then they feel like that they don't need to win back quite as many of, say, those younger voters in Michigan who might have abandoned them because of the Gaza issue or some other voters who they might be struggling with. So in terms of states where it's going to make a difference, I mean, yeah. Arizona, I think, obviously, but... Well, there, there's essentially two pieces of what they're looking at. It's what everybody knows. It's the industrial Midwest, the Blue Wall, uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the Sun Belt, in particular Arizona and Nevada, with a slight half step back on Georgia and North Carolina. But that's where all the resources, essentially billions of dollars in ads, are going to be going to those seven states. Susan, we've talked a little bit, we've talked a lot about the politics of this. Domenico has alluded to some of the human implications of it. But bef before we change topics, could you just talk about the human implications of the decision in, in Arizona? Yeah, I think it's really important, right? We're in, it's almost like this sort of paradox, right? That, uh, you know, uh, remember that people immediately greeted this decision by the Arizona Supreme Court to reinstate an 1864 law before Arizona was even a state. Uh, we're talking about a, a time, by the way, when the age, the legal age of consent in Arizona was 10 years old, okay? We're, that's the kind of restrictive law that's gonna affect thousands and thousands of women and girls in Arizona. That's reflected in many states across the country. I saw the Biden campaign uh, estimates that already one in three women in America uh, has lost access to uh, uh, reproductive health care as a result of the Supreme Court's decision. And so there's this almost ghoulish phenomenon, right? Like, we're like, well, it's a great issue for the Democrats or, you know, that it's really good news, but of course, in, in a real sense, these laws are actually going into effect. The Florida Supreme Court just recently put a very restrictive new law in effect in Florida. And remember that in many of the states in the South, it was already banned after uh, the Dobbs decision. And so Florida was where many women in the South were going to get uh, reproductive health care. And now many of them are not going to be able to. So it's, it's a weird situation where we're talking about the political advantage that might come to abortion rights supporters at a time when millions of women are actually losing their rights. I want to pivot to talking about uh, from from that, <laughs> that 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 grim reality to Mike Johnson's grim reality this week. I mean, ever since he became speaker, we've been talking about the way in which he's hanging on by his fingertips to the window ledge. You've been up on the Hill watching closely. Take us through his, his tumultuous week. What a week, what a day even yeah. today, dramatic. Uh, Mike Johnson was not able to get through just the very first procedural vote on what may be the most important national security program, according to our national security uh, officials, uh, that we have. You know, this is the Republican Party. This was, used to be the party of national security. And part of his problem was the man we've been talking about, former President Donald Trump, who said that that program, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, he said it was illegal, kill it, that it came after him. He was wrong. He was yeah. sending out in his Truth Social post incorrect, false information. He was confused or purposely being false about it. And as a result, more 19 Republicans were emboldened to just block this procedural move, creating quite a kerfuffle, embarrassing the speaker. Now, I will say, in just today, he was able to thread the needle and get over another major hurdle, able to defeat a poison pill amendment. 212 to 212 thanks to who progressive democrats who you know were they were they were trying to beat the speaker anyway it was a combination a wild day the speaker succeeded in getting through a FISA reauthorization which in his world will come up for a vote again when in two years when yeah. they all hope who will be president Donald Trump. So all of this is about a speaker trying to stay alive. He faces a potentially even worse week next week. We can talk about it. But Donald Trump is completely overseeing, in a way, all of his maneuvers. And he ended his week in Mar-a-Lago with Donald Trump, as you pointed out. Yeah, it's Trump, just so is the, Trump is the shadow speaker right now. I mean, the reason that FISA reform passed today is because they took it from five years to, to two years after Trump uh, posted on social media ab about it. And 
that that well, was. Well, FISA, even FISA as a Republican obsession wouldn't exist if Donald Trump didn't have this esoteric, as you say, somewhat incorrect idea about the role that it played in the Russiagate scandal. And so it's all about kind of. Uh, yeah. Personal grievances from the past. I mean, there's a serious, there's a serious group of of a left right coalition of privacy advocates who wanted to reform Section 702 to create an additional warrant process when Americans' communications get right. swept up in foreign collection. That was that was that was the the, the vote that uh, was defeated on a, on a tie today. Yeah, um, that's not the case that Trump was making. Yeah, Domenico, the culmination of Mike Johnson's week was that he he goes and he kisses the ring. At Mar-a-Lago, right? it feels like when you're interpreting Donald Trump and his relationship with various people who are trying to curry favor with him, it's all about reading the body language. As you looked at that tableau today, how did you assess the body language? <laughs> well, I mean, this is all about Republican politics, and you know, Mike Johnson, any speaker who's in a situation where. Any, at any point, somebody on the right can try to take you out, can try to vacate, you know, file a motion to vacate. You need the sort of sunshine of Donald Trump in the Republican, you know, party to say, this is my guy. Don't mess with him. He's okay. Or maybe not my guy totally, but he'll do for now, right? Yeah. I mean, when you look at our poll, 81% of Republicans have a favorable opinion of Donald Trump. It's, uh, you know, he's a mostly unfavorable when it comes to the country at large, but that's why this is all about Republican politics and what can get through and whether Mike Johnson can keep his job. Well, that's the thing. I mean, Donald Trump has become the ideology of the party. To, to Frank's point, uh, it's not. There are a principled argument, perhaps, on FISA that uh, for a long time there have been privacy advocates. That's not what this is about for Trump. Next week, there's going to be a fight for six months, essentially. The Republican, very slim majority in the House of Representatives, has single handedly blocked a popular bill funding uh, uh, U.S. assistance to Ukraine, $60 billion. Uh, the Ukrainian military is running out of air defense, is running out of weapons. Why? Because Mike Johnson is beholden to Donald Trump. He wouldn't be the speaker right now if Donald Trump had not signed off on him becoming speaker. He is a completely unknown, completely uh, politically inexperienced guy. He's an accidental speaker who wouldn't be speaker if it weren't for Donald Trump. And we all know uh, it's not the Republican Party's ideology to uh, bow down to Vladimir Putin. It is Donald Trump's ideology that has caused this stranglehold. And if they bring yeah. the bill to the floor, it would pass because there are enough Republicans who support American assistance to Ukraine. So to me, this is a classic test. And, you know, I think the message is not so great to Ukraine if uh, the speaker ends the week in Mar-a-Lago with Donald Trump. Well, I want to just I want to turn to some one of the other subplots here in the yeah. story, which is that you have Marjorie Taylor Greene holding yeah. this threat to, uh, to to basically take him out of his job. Yeah. And it seems like both Marjorie Taylor Greene and Mike Johnson are supplicants in front of yeah. Trump. Each, could you just talk us through some of that? Well, Green is threatening to depose Johnson if he puts a Ukraine bill on the floor. Trump doesn't support uh, a Ukraine bill generally. So Mike Johnson needed to basically get Trump's blessing to say, hey, you don't support Marjorie's uh, harebrained sch uh, scheme here to overthrow me, right? And Trump did do that. The great question, though, out of that meeting today in Mar-a-Lago is what path does Johnson now have on, on the Ukraine supplemental? Yeah. What promise did he get from Trump? What, you know, how he, he, he seems to have put the, the threat from Marjorie Taylor Greene at bay, at least to the extent that Trump signaled he doesn't want that. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, did that now? Did they make a deal on Ukraine? Was the and question we don't yeah, know. The, I possible, the possible path is a loan, which is what President Trump brought up today with Speaker Johnson, which is an interesting thing. And all this is still about sort of who is the Republican Party, where they go forth on Ukraine, on classic issues like abortion. And a quick note on that, I know we were saying grim reality, but on abortion, there is a spectrum, and there are many pro-choice, um, pro-life people who are in the middle, you know, who still think about life. You know, yeah. as well as the woman's right, and it's a complicated Lisa, issue. Just quickly, we're, uh, yeah. before we wrap up, will this pass? You're a resident Ukraine? Johnson Watch. Yeah, it could pass. I don't think it happens next week. Right now, it it it, it could. It's it's it's. Speaker Johnson is the only one who knows right now. He and President Trump, former President Trump, are having a conversation on that. Right now, it feels like no, not next week, but maybe two weeks or three weeks down the road. And don't forget, if they open uh, it up, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> 
we need to leave it there for now. And before I go, I wanted to extend my condolences to our NewsHour colleagues for the loss of the legendary journalist Robert McNeil. Thanks to our panelists for joining us tonight. And be sure to check out TheAtlantic.com for a profile of Trump ally and often controversial Congressman Matt Gates. I'm Franklin Four. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Certified financial planner professionals are proud to support Washington Week with The Atlantic. CFP professionals are committed to acting in their clients' best interest. More information at letsmakeaplan.org. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.